turn this over to <laughs> Brett. Alright, um, first I apologize for all my bad typing and everything, just different computer uh, and Windows and buddy everything. Um, so I, uh, I mostly do backend development and scalability stuff. I do, I work with almost every popular NoSQL database um, now in production. It's kind of embarrassing. Um, uh, we call it popular, right? <laughs> so, uh, let's see, um, I guess, uh, I also always do all the ops where I am, so I deploy things, uh, I monitor them, I get called at 2 a.m. when they break. So everything I say is going to have a tilt towards that. I'm, uh, I'm a cynical person, um, and I really worry about trade-offs. So I'll try to bring those up as often as possible, because I think that's what bites you the most with Redis. It's very easy to use. You get into it, and then something you realize breaks at 2 a.m., etc. <laughs> So, um, let's see, uh, so again, not my computer, oh god, not my tabs, <laughs> oh god, what the hell are you doing? Uh, let's see, first I just want to point out some celebrity news. <laughs> so Redis, I know it looks terrible and I, oh my god, okay, this is, okay. <laughs> It's IE8. It's oh my God. Okay, so it doesn't look at all like this. I don't know if there's Firefox on the desktop. Okay. Right. Chrome. Yeah, there you go. All right, guys. Ooh, a countdown. Yeah. Okay, look at this. Look at this difference. Look at that. Look at that, everybody. Look at that. Okay, so um, first of all, uh, the Redis audio site is great. Uh, lists all the commands. Um, uh, I guess I should start to say Redis is an in-memory database that is non-relational. So I imagine everyone here, if you're a developer, you used MySQL or SQL Server or Postgres or something. So uh, Redis doesn't have queries; it has commands. There's uh, a bunch of them, but the, the list is actually not that long um, when you realize how common sense they are. And um, uh, anyways, I just want to point this out because I'll be kind of into it to show you interesting things. Um, the best way to describe Redis is that it's a networked, uh, it's a heap that's available via the network. So uh, I do Python mostly. Um, I'm sure people use PHP or you know, Ruby or whatever. That's all the same. So every language has you know your dictionary. Um, so I just you know you have a an object. It's in memory. And it's there. Uh, of course, this is in my local Python process. The advantage of Redis is that it makes all these things available over. Basically, the network. It's uh, some people call it a key value store. I would call it an object store because it actually has knowledge of the data structures. Um, and uh, so, you, you, all the commands that you would run on on uh, local data structures, like setting uh, x to one, to set, you can do the same things in Redis. Uh, and I'm going to show you those. I'm going to run through all the basic data types. So, um, the most simple is the uh, string. You can set any key, uh, Redis things are always found by a key. There's no, like I said, there's no query. There's no select where. It's always the key. Uh, set does a string, so you know the hello world uh, example. That's <coughs> true. Get back, right? That's over network. So if I have the patience right now to make another Python process, I could get that there too, right? Makes sense, to everyone. Pretty basic. Um, uh, so the the interesting thing here is that Redis also allows you to uh, treat strings like integers. It converts them every time, so that's something to keep in mind in the, in the trade-off thing. Uh, if I set x to 1, I can now anchor x. Um, anchor it again. It returns the value. Of course, that's set Redis. Does so that make sense? Uh, so the 1 is a number there, but it stores it internally as a string? Yes. And so if you notice, uh, and I guess this is a Pythonism, my get here returns string. This is always a string. Um, so when you when you write your APIs uh, in most languages, I mean, uh, I guess it could convert it if they detected it was a could be an integer, but that would be terrible. So you you always have to do that yourself. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> oh god. Okay, I give up. Um, <laughs> so uh, anyways, you have to convert it yourself. Uh, I guess. Uh, yeah, the thing to keep in mind is that it's just throwing it as a string. When you do anchor, it's it's saying, okay, uh, I don't know, no C, but it's doing a, a 
a character to i, it's turning it into an integer, it's incrementing it, and it's turning back to a character and putting it back into the database. So it's kind of gross, but that's what it does. So for example, back to my uh, hello, r.inker, x, of course, um, that, that did convert to an integer because it was, it, <laughs> uh, because hello is uh, uh, an array of bytes, and I guess it converted it. I don't know, I just, you don't do that. Um, <laughs> uh, basically, that is, like, um, uh, you are just working with keys and right? so you make abstractions that <coughs> that have knowledge of the keys and what they should be hitting and, and stuff like that. This is something that's very common if you uh, try to think of an example. Um, every every Redis uh, key has a type, so if I were to anchor a hash or a list, obviously that would fail also. Um, so this is great for uh, Basically, caching things. Um, you, the hello example. Uh, that's still what X is. I already forget. Yeah, uh, I can use Redis kind of like memcache. Um, I can tell it to expire, uh, and so just a uh, people don't use Python or IPython. I'm going to do this a lot because I don't remember things. Uh, the APIs, and this is really nice. Uh, if you don't have anything like this in your language, you should switch languages. Uh, so uh, anyways, it's pretty obvious, right? Set an expire flag and a key for time. It takes uh, you know, ourself, if you don't do Python, uh, name and time. So um, uh, expire x, and uh, I can say 100 seconds, right? So now I can check the time to live on that, that, that key. Uh, oh, <coughs> the time to live, uh, well, obviously, it's ticking down. When that goes away, um, Doing a git will return nil, just like if I said um, this, this key doesn't exist. Right? I always get nothing back. So um, this is a way to set keys, uh, just like people do in memcache. Store anything you want for a minute or whatever. And uh, uh, it's a lot of people use it as a drop in memcache. I do. As, this is one of my uh, the, the ops person me um, warning you. Um, uh, there's a big difference between Redis and Memcache, and mostly it's in the clients. So I kind of skipped this. I think this before we started. R, sorry, is a an object of a connection to Redis. That I guess hopefully should be obvious by now. Um, this is assuming localhost and it's assuming one server and a default port, and it's connected and that is great. The difference is uh, if I were using Memcache, it would be something like uh, Memcache, uh, Memcache, an instance, and you give it a pool, and it would be you know server one. Server two, uh, etc. Right. So that, that therein lies uh, the devil in details or whatever. Um, one instance running Redis is great; you can cache everything in the world in it. And then suddenly at 2 a.m., that one server dies, and you don't have any cache anymore. Uh, Memcache is built to be distributed. Uh, the clients know that they detect a failure if they're I mean, any good client does, uh, and it rehashes and. It, Starts using uh, new locations for the keys, et cetera, et cetera. It's a big deal uh, if you uh, if you depend on it. And basically, I guess my point is that if you can use Redis on one server as your entire cache server, then really you could also use um, the file system. You could just store stuff in files and you can read it. Like it, at the point where you're where you can just live on one memcache, um, uh, you can use Redis, but it's not like you're not really proving proving anything. Like all blogs in the world could probably run a file system cache too. Um, so, is so there, are there any options for distributed threads? So if I wanted to run... Yeah, so, so like, uh, memcache isn't smart. So Redis itself does nothing different than memcache. Memcache doesn't have an advantage here except for the clients. So the alternative is that you could contribute a patch to your favorite languages thing that would treat it like one. But it would be pretty different because... That's right. Because you'd have to be doing something like R is Redis dot, um, you know, um, I don't know, I don't even know what to call it, like, like failover Redis, right? Because when you start using Redis as a real data store, um, you don't want it to fail over to another server. Like, caching is one thing, but when you start setting, um, when you start storing your entire user in there, you don't want, when a server goes down, to say, I did get for Brett, and I got a none, clearly Brett doesn't exist. That's like a terrible failure, right? So you have to treat caching and not caching very differently. So this is kind of, it's like a cultural thing, I guess. Um, this is why, I, I don't know, I just personally I avoid caching Redis because then cache is so easy to run, just my recommendation. So you're saying the uh, 
clients being different, that's because of Memcache because the, the distributed part of the client side? Yep, yep. So almost all Memcache clients, um, at least the ones that I use and have used, uh, are either backed by, let's say, the, the really good Java library, because the, you know, they live in their own ecosystem, and then there's a C library that most languages like Python, Ruby, uh, Patriot, etc., wrap called uh, the Memcache D, I think. And um, that is the abstraction that detects the server's down, you know, we pull over, lots of very, very, very important things for caching. Anyways, um, that's like a whole other talk. So I'll, I'll uh, let's see. Um, I just want to point out Expire. We only have really strings right now. So, so right, yeah. Okay, yeah. Expire, when does it get resolved? Like when you try to get it? Or uh, it should expire by now. Oh, you mean in, internally? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the git definitely will force it if it hasn't been expired already. But Redis also does, uh, and it's been like a year since I read it, but um, I think like every second it checks a subset of keys. It's literally like a random. Oh, okay. It's like, it's like I know these keys are here. Let's check 10% or 1% you know, of them. Uh, do you have an expired thing? Are you expired? So it's like, it kind of <coughs> cleans up. Um, uh, yeah. So uh, you stored a um, a string in uh, in a key, and then you said that uh, r dot type, and it returns string. If you put a, an integer in there, you said that it returns a string. If you, if you put an integer in there and say r dot type on an integer, will yep. it convert it to an integer to see if it's an integer? No, nope, it's uh, so that's always always and forever a string. Uh, <clears throat> So that's just that's a Redis type, not doesn't know anything about Python. Python even this this library sees my one and serializes it. Uh, sorry. So uh, one important thing is that Redis is also ASCII protocol, very basic. And I guess I should point that out. Um, I just didn't want to. Uh, um, so you can. Uh, I just prefer Python. It's just easier for me to get around. Um, this is Redis CLI, so I could uh, I could get x and it's one. Uh, I can type x. So when I also say get x or, or set x one, this is I mean that is literally sent over the wire. It's like telnet. You could and I, I could do that too. I just uh, don't waste too much time. But um, it literally sends set x one, and that one is ASCII, not the actual byte integer. You know, really truly one. So that's why Redis just gets it, just shoves it in there. Later, if you happen to want to anchor it, it happily <coughs> says, okay, I assume this person knows what they're doing, converts it to a one, anchors, converts it back to a string. So what does it do inside here if you uh, try to anchor it? Oh, okay. Um, okay, so, okay, so, uh, all right, so that actually, that actually was a good error on the Python side. Uh, it wasn't, it didn't actually convert it. So it, it uh, yeah, because, Right, because a uh, uh, character to I or whatever, C to I, C level will fail for this thing, it knows where. So, uh, where's my piece? Okay. Um, anyways, string is the first, so I just want to like kind of blast through some of these other ones. Uh, the types that Redis supports. Um, hashes are just like I was saying, uh, I have a dictionary in Python, I can, um, it has all these H commands. Um, they're pretty obvious, I guess I should have shown you. Uh, there's not a namespace for strings, so it wouldn't be as useful. Um, set, and again, we'll look at it because I don't keep this memorized. It's just use X again. Uh, uh, so this is kind of like a nested, and it only goes one level deep. It's not like you can keep on nesting like you're in Python itself. Um, so, to uh, bar, right? You gotta pass the hash, right? Oh, 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 sorry. So uh, each set inspects the object that's already in Redis and tries to uh, add to it. I'm, I already had a string in there, that was a better decision on my part, so no. So uh, h get all will return, it'll convert it to a Python dictionary. Again, if you use PHP or whatever, you know, it'll convert properly to your language. Just, you know, any client will do this. So there are other commands. They're mostly obvious. Um, I'm trying to remember if they're any like stand out. So you can get set individual keys. This is what you use to represent objects. I could have a user Brett, you know, user name, birthday, whatever. Um, the you thing is, there's no nesting at all. There's no nesting at all. It's uh, yeah. 
Uh, that's kind of interesting. I'm not really sure what the big reason there is. Uh, one, one cool reason, so uh, something you'll see really common in, um, in Redis, no, always, you should do this, uh, is you namespace things. So uh, I would have user, bread, um, yep, kind of like one, it doesn't matter. So the reason that you wouldn't do user, bread, and then user, bread, you know, username, and then user, bread, A, so you keep in mind, these are all strings, so this is set, is the, reason, the advantage of using a hash is it just keeps them all together, so you can do a get all, you know, get, get them all back to your app. Another thing is that uh, Redis implements really cool um, uh, data structure optimization, so a hash that's like less than like, I don't know, I think it's like 32 items, it just cramps into an array because it's really way faster to just grab it for an array than to like actually have a big hash and all that stuff. Um, it's, it's really smart, it does like, you know, the best thing it really can at the C level or, you know, the machine level, so uh, there are advantages. There's not really anything more complex or interesting about hashes though, so I, I don't really, unless there's any questions, I don't have any other things to say about them. Can you set like 10 to 12? Oh yeah. Um, yeah so uh, you can set uh, uh, inset is mini set, multi set. Hmm. So this would go. Uh, oh right. So I guess in Python land, this would be the uh, the dictionary, right? Uh, just try to walk. So h uh, and get or h get all. Right. So you can you know you give your language level object and it sets the whole thing. Um, I don't, I can't think of a really good use that I've used hashes for. I think it would be for if you wanted to use Redis as your main data store. You know, you didn't even have SQL. Like I said, if you want to store users. Um, I've never done that. Redis has always for me just been like, kind of like spice. It's like a, the thing I need to like fill a gap. That's kind of what I recommend too. Uh, I'll kind of slowly get into that as I go through these. Hey, check out the late, is it persist, is, is it at all durable at all? Uh, yeah, I, I didn't really know where to drop that in because I didn't want to freak people out with, I don't know who was interested. <laughs> um, so Redis is uh, in memory, so right now I just, uh, anything you set is purely in memory, right? This is by default. Uh, every, uh, and this is where I need to slap. Um, so uh, the Redis comp is pretty basic. Uh, let's see what's here. So, and it's pretty well documented too. So this is the default. Um, every 900 seconds, if one thing has changed, it will it will dump to to this. That's an atomic operation. Every 300, if 10 things have changed, it'll dump. Every 60, if 10,000 things have changed, it'll dump. So this is like the default that's kind of tuned towards you know, are you hammering it or if you want to change one thing, we don't want to save every 60 seconds. Um, it's just kind of assumed. So of course you can tune these. You can do whatever you want here. Uh, th like I said, this is an atomic dump. It actually. Um, uh, I don't know who loves Unix. Uh, it, it literally forks the the guy, the child that forks is what dumps the literally the contents of the heap. Very rudimentary, but pretty awesome actually. Um, so this, like, I guess I'm just asking from a high availability perspective. I mean, right. I get that the data is like saved off, and you know, you might luck out, but yeah. So uh, there, Redis has master slaves, just like uh, Postgres and MySQL. Those are those are sent. It's asynchronous though, so uh, the other thing that you can do is um, Redis. So, the, the, again, this is a default file, so this is off by default. Um, append only would mean every time I do a set x1, it literally drops that ASCII into this file that says set x1, right? It's just this error running file that uh, is, there's a BG rewrite AOF, and so it, it'll rewrite that file because it, that file just grows forever. It's, it's every command you've ever run. Uh, and then on top of that, you can tune it to, you can make the default here is once a second, it'll write those, those changes out to this append only file if you turn it on. If you choose always, it will actually, uh, it'll do what you want in that case. Uh, it'll, when you do set X, before it says okay, it actually does it right, flushes, says I, I wrote that to the disk. In general, I don't think anyone smart does that. And Redis is very much used as kind of like a, uh, server for denormalization and stuff like that, maybe. Uh, I've never used it as my one data bit, my, my one point of knowledge or whatever you would call it. Um, I, I don't know, it, it feels a little scary to me to, to do that, personally. I, what, uh, what kind of stuff did you denormalize in Discus? Uh, so we, we did a lot of um, counters because doing a set, uh, or sorry, doing, doing an anchor uh, on X, this is in memory, right? Uh, you can hammer this like 
100,000 times a second on one server because there's no transaction, <laughs> there's no writing to disk, and that's an advantage here. So uh, the key would be more like, uh, said, you know, um, CNN, and then uh, hits, and then 2012, whatever the hell, it doesn't matter. Um, <coughs> and then it would be more like an anchor, right? And so we would we would keep track of these, and I, this is one of those things where I'm, I'm using a random computer, so I, uh, I could show you, Anyways, this was a, that's a, a big multi-git in Redis that has the points for all these times for each, the concept of a comment versus a like versus who was there. Um, so we used it for analytics. Um, was it, it was not the, the true source, it was just a uh, pre-calculated one? Well, because uh, it was the true source for analytics. The difference is that analytics can always be rebuilt from the real source because we, we were comments service. So, uh, I assume people, yeah, I don't know, uh, discusses the comment system that's down here at the bottom. So, of course, we keep the comments in, uh, they weren't in Redis, they were in Postgres. So, worst case scenario, and I did end up doing this a few times, like you get the Redis code wrong or something like that, or Redis goes down in a horrific way or something like that, you can backfill this. You can just, you know, select and, and, and re-inker because Redis is very fast and just blast through there and refill that. As a matter of fact, um, because Redis is in memory, it's very expensive. We didn't have this on for all users. Uh, this is a, something that you pay for, but you can go to the Discuss site today and put in your credit card, and we backfill your data. And that's run by the same exact thing. It, it's like CNN goes and puts in their credit card. It just goes through and, and uh, in reverse chronological order, sets all these time, time windows. Each hour gets filled with how many comments and likes, etc. cetera. Um, unique users, like this whole, this whole big thing. So, um, like I said, it was the store for analytics, but not the main store for the data that powered the analytics. So. Um, that, yeah, the, the order, <laughs> the order for this is hard. So I just have data structures and then kind of random shit later. Um, the that idea of backfilling is hugely important for Redis and honestly any database that isn't your main source of knowledge. Um, for everything, you want to be able to have the power to clean up stuff that you don't want anymore, because this isn't a SQL database, you can't just like randomly select it later and say, <laughs> show me the stuff that was added a year ago, I don't want it anymore. Um, uh, you want to be able to backfill, because trust me, you're going to get the code wrong, and again, you can't just do an update all, or you know, update where. So you want this way to be able to say, I guess I, I should show you the, uh, the um, you can do keys, that lists all the keys in Redis, right? Um, you can do keys, user, and you can glob. Right? So this is how you could say, um, get rid of all CNN for 2012, January, because I definitely pumped those up, and re-backfill, and it would go through and fix those, right? So you're, you just need to make sure that any abstractions you write over this have the ability to, to, to trim large data structures that aren't needed anymore, because again, this is always in memory, forever and always in memory. There's no, there's no, uh, it does persist to this, but it never pages from this. It's not like Postgres or MySQL. It is always in very expensive RAM. So you want to use this for things that need to be very fast, or if there's not enough of them, like it's a bounded data set, you know it's only going to be like maybe 10 megs, because it's like kind of some hit count for all your users, which is actually, when you think about it, unless you have literally billions, is not that many megabytes in memory, like single integers. Just, uh, it needs to be bounded, so. Um, With the keys, can you fetch all of those at once? Uh, can you delete them all at once? Or, yeah, so. Or do you have to iterate over them going more? So, uh, delete is. Um, delete. delete is variadic, so you can, meaning um, you can give it, you know, x, y, z, right? Um, give it as many of those as you want. So, you can nuke easily. You can't really fetch all keys in Redis because the same methods don't work on the different types of keys. So, if they're all the same kind of key, yes, you can. So you can do a multi-git, that's for strings. But that's not going to work on, uh, did I have, what's it called, hash x? Uh, uh, 
Oh, did I, is that the one that I expired? Oh, I'll see if you get it right. I think hashtags are Oh, oh, it, it just it just iterated over. It just did 8K. Okay, there it is. No, I don't know. Um, Multi-gig is for strings. You cannot, I mean, let me just start one. Is it each and gig? Well, yeah, yeah, it would be, but um, but my point is that you can't just take an arbitrary list of keys and say, like, get all these keys. Because one could be a string, one could be a hash, one could be a list, etc. So, So, um, uh, but any abstraction you write will generally be tilted towards some data structure, right? So you probably could do, you know, iterate over the keys, um, compare them to what's in Postgres or something, which I guess would be expensive. You might as well just overwrite it. But there's all there's all, all sorts of things you can do backfill, you know. So, so that blobby? Uh, okay, so I, is it, I know it's in memory, so it's going to be relatively fast. But uh, is there any indexing to assist the globbing, or is it just going to be no? A scam? So uh, you're too smart for me, right? Um, no. So uh, uh, yeah, that was definitely um, that. That was something that I that I had on the list. Uh, it is not. It is literally an array in memory. So this is something that um, <laughs> that you actually shouldn't do. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's hard. You you have to do this at some point. Um, so this is something that you do at you run at 2 a.m. or something like that, just depending on what your needs are. Um, uh, maybe, maybe for maybe a clean. Let me explain it to the group first. Uh, at Discuss, for example, I used Redis for API throttling. So it was, uh, again, I'll just use CNN as an example. And 2012, 01, 01, and then we didn't went down to the minute, so you know, the, the 23rd hour and the, and the 12th minute. And, uh, Uh, we get this inker. Actually, I should be using inker. But this is smart, so let me change this to 13, right? Like, it just assumes you wanted to start from zero, right? Anyways, so, we, you know, they're hitting us with the API, and we're increasing this. Um, really handy. Uh, then we would do for the next minute. And then to check it, we would actually do a, a uh, r dot make multi kit for, uh, and I'm not going to type it out, but the last five minutes. I guess you have a, a rolling five minute window of hits, right? So you can always be very accurate. Like in the last five minutes, they hit us as much. Should we throttle them or whatever? So um, that worked great and it was awesome. And then I, I wrote that, it took like an hour. And then uh, then I had a cron that ran every night that did uh, a keys on, keys on, you know, anything star uh, 2012 or one, you know, the day before. Or, or whatever, like a month ago, you clean up and it would, um, that's not gonna work, but whatever. Uh, it would go through and it would delete these because we we don't really care about like three months ago who we followed. Uh, that worked great, it was awesome. I swear to God, like nine months, nothing ever happened, right? And then one day we decided, completely unrelated to Redis, that our comment system, the embed, is actually gonna be powered by the API. So the 1% of users that use the API went from 100 to 100% of users that use the API. So every single day, every single site that got hit by Discuss was using the API. And when you ran keys, it was now it was now globbing on an array that wasn't, you know, ten thousand items long. It was, you know, I don't know, like two hundred million, right? It was huge, and it would uh, Redis is blocking single threaded. Sorry, I'm like all out of order here. That's really important. <laughs> <laughs> Redis is. In memory, single threaded. Um, it has it has multiple threads for I/O, so it can wait for commands to get get them ready. But it's when one command is running, it's a whole big world lock. Does the things it needs to do, unlocks, and does the next thing. <laughs> um, so that's a huge deal, right? So you run keys with a glob on that, and all of a sudden, uh, sort of, you know, get called at 2 a.m. The site's down, Brett. Like, what the hell's going on? Um, so. It gets kind of weird. You don't really want to depend on keys. Are you sure it's a global lock on the entire key set? Positive. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. That, that sounds like a performance like bottleneck. Like, um, well, uh, keys is about the worst thing. Um, well, I'm with you on keys because it's getting multiple. Yeah. Still, even so, if it's getting hit. so something really cool about Redis um, is, uh, yeah, get, it's going to be really boring, but I'm going to open it anyway. Okay. They always have the big annotation, the time complexity. Um, <laughs> you want to take this in mind when you when you use Redis, like you know, we use anything, but it's really cool. They just drop on every page, right? So uh, the slowest thing in Redis is I/O, right? It's it's uh, this is this is my computer or my client, right? 
This is the this is the network the network cable, right? This is Redis. This is the network cable. This is a pretty awesome slide, isn't it, guys? And, uh, <laughs> and this is and this is me, right? This is I want to set. And this is physics, right? This is where the magic happens, right? This is literally light waiting. And then uh, that's Redis. Redis has got local memory, right? It takes nanoseconds to do like an anchor, right? We're talking like nothing. Then it's sending back to me. So even if you have, um, you know, we had like 100 web servers, and each of those have like no, I see the mathematics. I see the mathematics in your proof. Sure, but <laughs> I'm waiting for my, you know, my double prize or whatever. Uh, so even if you have like you know, 100,000 servers all running inkers. Most of the time, they're just waiting on the thing to get to Redis. Redis is sitting there like, it's bored. I swear to God, I can go to any production Redis I run, and I have not seen the CPU over like 5%. It's just sitting there, like, like uh, you know, because all you're really doing in it is the most, except for keys, and I think that's the gotcha that I was, I was saving, I guess. Um, you're doing the most, um, I don't know, common sense, the most correct thing against any given data structure. That's really the only, other than keys, the only APIs they offer to you. Um, so uh, I guess with that, I want to I want to show lists because those are really important. This is a really big use. Uh, are there any other questions? Because feel free. Yeah. Uh, you said that what well, didn't do any paging. It, so it, it does it pre-allocate? You know, you, you say how much space you want to give it, and it locks all memory pages, or does it does it grow? Or oh no, uh, so it, it does have to malloc. It does grow. It just doesn't. I'm just saying it never pages from disk. If you set something, it never like writes it and says, okay, I can use this memory for something else. It's just always sitting in RAM. So uh, you don't set a max like memcache. You can. Uh, you don't set. You, don't, you usually don't have control over. There's a max memory. There's a max memory thing that's off by default, and uh, you can have it try to. When it hits that limit, it will try to find things that are expired to get rid of. But if you don't have things expired, if you're not using Redis as a cache, which most people, in my opinion, don't, um, you just get an error. So. Um, you can't fill. You can fill Redis up if you. Well, your virtual memory is petabytes if you're on a 64-bit system. So personally, this is an opinion thing. I'm like I said, I'm an ops guy. I prefer to swap and get. I should. I've gotten an alert when I got close to filling my RAM anyway. I should be on it, thinking about what to do next, right? I prefer to swap because at least then the OS will code this for me since Redis won't. So because um, getting. Getting it, uh, I couldn't set that key because I was out of memory error could mean that I couldn't make that financial transaction because you were out of memory. I couldn't add this important VIP user because you're out of memory. Like I wanted to still work but slowly instead of not work. Um, so I've done, I've messed with max memory. I wouldn't bother. But uh, I guess to answer your question, it's, Redis starts out like it. Like I swear to God, like one meg of RAM, it's tiny. You know, because it's very simple. And then as you do things, it just malks and grows. Is it built on memory map files, or does it saving? Does it save? Uh, no, it's not. It's, it's not a memory map file. I don't believe. Um, I believe you know it's, it. It has it has to have a global hash because it, it knows the keys. It knows where they go to. And when it forks to save, it actually just iterates over that, that hash and says you know remember that this was here. Remember that this was here. Uh, the the saving does does peg your CPU at one hundred percent. But you know you have multiple cores in your servers, right? So like anything I've been running in Redis on is pretty much bored all day anyway. So um, for us, every 15 minutes we just dump you know whatever's in there. Uh, just depends on your use case. Um, again, you can do uh, master slave in Redis, uh, and that would be going over the network. The slave could be the one that saves. You could save every minute. You could append to the disk synchronously. That's definitely you know if you want to run Redis in production and you're worried about your data, you have to have a slave because Thank you on the server. There's nothing that's going to save you. Right? Any questions? Does it shrink back down? Um, no, I don't think it ever gives anything back to the operating system, if that's what you mean. Yeah. But I mean, the operating system is pretty good at paging those things out. It's not actually in use anyway. So I don't, I don't, I don't worry too much. Um, you, for most use cases of Redis, you probably aren't. Um, um, like ballooning and going down and up and stuff. You kind of just like, Hopefully, pretty steady. I'm, I'm just that's my experience. So for Red, for Discus's scale, because you guys get a lot of traffic, I'm sure. Yeah. How many Redis instances did you run, and what was the multi-tenancy like? How many tenants did you have on like? Well, I don't know. Did you tell well, me? the tenants number would you mean like uh, users? Well, yeah, like you or accounts or whatever. Yeah, like CNN I mean, would that, probably be a gigantic I, account. I don't. I don't know that off the top of my head, and I don't know how valuable it would be without knowing like every you know. That's fine. Well, what, what's the, uh, but again, so um, because Redis is 
single threaded one nice advantage in the fact that it starts at one meg mm -hmm. and that it's uh, completely key based, right? Like untang give me this key, yeah. right? Um, that's the easiest thing in the world to shard. So yeah. Yeah. Um, just to again sh uh, just show everyone what I mean, I guess. Um, what, do we have CSC 32 on this or something? Or, you know what it is, Travis? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, no. Okay. So, oh man, it's a keyboard. Uh, what the hell? One of those crazy magic modules. Okay, I give up. Um. Anyways, the, the point is that the key space. Uh, you're always accessing the key. You're not doing a select. You're not. You're not doing a, a where. You're not doing any anywhere your query. So it's really easy to take any string, hash it. Modulo that number by however many instances you have and go to the right server to fetch something. Yeah. So we would actually start um, eight Redis instances per server. And they would the, each server would have like 32 gigs of RAM to start. And then we have multiple servers. Um, this is a very different use case than, for example, uh, I worked at Mass Relevance and I guess I didn't say that at the beginning. Um, we have, we're a Twitter partner, we have a Twitter firehose. So we have 10 megs a second steady and we put a lot of things in Redis. We use it for our queue. So um, we only have one. Uh, we have two instances of Redis. One is use of the queue because it never saves. It's, it's, it literally exists because we wanted the settings here to be different because uh, we don't care about if the key gets lost and we don't want to waste the you know the CPU cycle saving it. We have another one that actually has data that we increment like little counters. Again, like I said earlier, none of those are like the business would not be threatened if they were lost because. It takes a lot more setup for Redis. Have you talked about the queuing at all? Sorry? Have you talked about the queue? No, case? sorry. So, yeah, I, I, keep, uh, I keep getting distracted. Uh, right. Here, let me, uh, that's what I was trying to get to next. So, uh, Redis has lists, very simple. Um, So it's a doubly linked list, goes on forever, right? Or however long you want it to be. Um, you can also R push, push on the other end. But for Q, you would just push on the left and you would pop on the right. So uh, R pop in my list. Of course, I didn't make these different, so it's not very helpful. But um, you get back to the thing that was I put on first. That could be a JSON document telling you, run this job, this class at this time, this user, blah, 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 blah. This is exactly what uh, Rescue, which is very popular in the Ruby world, I don't know what they would have that I would show you though. Um, they, they create queues for each, they create lists for each queue that you name. Um, you just, uh, you have a Ruby API that says, you know, run this job asynchronously and all that literally is doing is saying L push with this serialized job name. It's just like uh, Celery actually has a Redis backend too. <coughs> That's in the Python world. I don't know what anyone else uses because that's all I do. Um, so it's very simple. Again, trade-off thing, things to keep in mind. If you're the kind of person that gets called at 2 a.m. is um, if your consumers stop popping and working, it's going to just grow on memory. As, as fast as you put things in, you know, you're, you can fill your machine. And uh, I really, that's I on the on the list side. That's the only major disadvantage in Redis. Other than that, it's not persistent. And that your all your stuff does have to fit in RAM. If you, this is like a one-hour solution, so you can you could be using this in production like really quick, and it'd be really great. And like I said, we cram the Twitter firehose in there, so um, uh, it's really it's a really good start. If you find yourself needing uh, other functionality, there are much better things like RabbitMQ, uh, which is an implementation of ActiveMQ or no. Yeah. No, it's not active. Advanced it's, message. It's, it's, a, it's the other A. A and Q. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyways, um, it does everything. You know, you can have users. Uh, more importantly, Reddit uh, Rabbit take, uh, writes this, so you can have eight bajillion jobs a second, and it'll just like put them on disk and wait for later to tell your clients about them. 
Um, whereas again, it has to sit in it has to sit in main memory on Redis. Um, and you're saying there's no way to set a bound on a queue to where the puts will deny? In Redis? Yeah. No, because it's not a queue, it's a list. Um, it's not, yeah, you're using it as a queue, but no, there's not. Uh, you can, uh, checking the size, the size is stored, I don't think, I mean, we could look it up, and it'd take too long, but uh, I'm, I'm most positive that doing the link, the link is an integer that stores with each list, so you can check that before you do something. You can also trim to a certain size, so you can have something that does that manually, but no, there's no way to like refuse an insert in a list in Redis. Okay. Does that make sense? And the so, length is not order in? Down the no, that's what I was saying. I'm, I'm almost positive it's, it's 01. I'm pretty sure it just increases and gets better. Gotcha. Cool. You, okay. Yeah, because it, it realizes that people, I mean, we use it a lot, and I'm pretty sure we'd be down if it wasn't. So, cool. <laughs> that's, uh, like, we, could look up, we could look it up, but it'll take you too long to all tabs. So don't worry about it. <laughs> um, let's see. The other main things that are kind of obvious data structures in all your languages are sets. Um, those are really simple. <laughs> sad, that's sad. Um, so, whatever, set. Um, a threat and uh, Travis. Oh, oh, there you go, Travis. <laughs> S members is is gets you all the things, right? Um, if I add if I add Brett again, oh, wait, oh, it like uh, it returns zero because it means it didn't add it because it's already there, right? So that's nothing special. Pretty obvious. Uh, we use this for. Um, I mean, anything unique, right? So uh, I used it for unique users that hit a page at a certain time. Again, the key is all time series stuff, right? Um, you know, food blog, and then some date, you know, da 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 da, and you add users every hour. That way you can always fetch back the cardinality of a set is the size of a set. So I can just say there are 17,000 unique users here um, in for this hour, and I can do that like it's nothing done. It's just, again, it's an integer that's stored very fast. It's uh, we did that because it was just kind of painful to uh, on every page view. If you let's say you wanted to put it in an RDBMS, you would be doing an insert, and then it would give you an error if you had a unique constraint, right? You would be doing that every time just to make sure that you had your set of users, and then to read it back, you'd be doing a select and a count. Um, anyways, this is really handy. Um, then there's sorted sets which have a score attached to them, and they're sorted. So, oh wow, that's quite an upstream. Um, uh, let's see. So, I, don't I use these a lot. You know, like, is that part of it? Um, You can so you can read them back in a in an order because it's they have scores. Right? So that's an index from zero to the end of the end of the Z set um, with scores. So this is in reverse order. So this is really handy for um, uh, for doing like any sort of top lists. Um, you want to sort users like who hit a page or who made the most comments or who did anything right. Uh, I can, uh, in my Z set, I can anchor Joe by uh, 50, right? And so, you know, you can do this anchor, in, it's like inside of the set, instead of uh, anchoring a top level key in, you can always have this, this list of top users or something. The problem is that there's no decay built in. Um, this is only good for top lists, or you have to have a, a set per hour, and then you have to you can like union sets in Redis, and you can try to you know see who's the best at X thing for X time. It's it's um, they're really handy for denormalizing queries. Like uh, on a news site, you have um, show me the, the last ten news stories. This is perfect because your score could be the Unix timestamp. Everything that gets put in later with a higher score is on there. And then you can run uh, Z, let's see, they have a remove by, yeah, by score. You could say remove anything after the first 10. So that could be run uh, periodically to just keep it short. And it's nice because you just grab this instead of running the query. Although that's pretty easy to cache, so you, you, know, you just have to have a right use case where you want to denormalize that for some reason. 
um, without, I don't know, without putting it just in a cache or just in a, in a string serialized. So uh, I, I found it best for the top users thing. It's really cool. Like we had all users for each forum account to show you who's the busiest user on your website and stuff like that. Um, let's see. So the number durability. Um, Redis is definitely, like, normally in most deployments, I think it's a single point of failure, so you have to either have this a master slave set up, um, or you set up, you can set up timeouts in most clients, maybe even this socket timeout, and then there's also just a socket timeout. Yeah, so like, I mean, if your Redis server goes down and you've decided that it's not your main database, it doesn't store all your data, then, uh, you definitely want to like have a timeout. You, it's very much manual code. It's like if the timeout happens, uh, I'm not going to show this feature, or I'm going to say come back later, or I'm going to show zero for the score. Um, this is just one of those things that, again, it's just it has nothing to do with Redis so much as the idea that either you have to decide that X database I already use and Redis are now um, both primary, and I'm going to worry about them both all the time, or one is like a secondary caching denormalization store. So. Um, just something to worry about. Uh, we've always, I, I've been saved by timeouts before because I very much like the Redis is down, whatever. Just like don't show that thing for right now while I fix it. Um, just something, just something to think about. Uh, the biggest thing, uh, biggest like advice in general is, and I think I can find that. But the, uh, you know, my awesome physics thing. Um, so uh, Redis has pipelines, and what this means is. Um, Um, you can you can send it a group of commands all at once, and uh, it's that way it's one round trip. So instead of like four uh, you and users Redis dot increment you know uh, user dot id one to go through and increment all these users that maybe did some activity, you would um, you create a pipeline object. And again, this is in every every um, library has some version of this where you call pipeline, you get this object that just kind of literally is just storing ASCII commands in itself. So you could do for you and users now, and it'd be p dot, oops, well, let me do one that'll work. This is, this is a Python, that's a, a list of 100 integers, um, pipeline dot set, uh, the string version of that integer to 100, right? And so nothing really happened there. It's just, it's just sitting here in this object. But then when you run execute, um, it'll send these all to Redis at once, um, which will be like orders of magnitude faster than doing the loop because there's not a round trip per thing. Again, the memory is the, the fastest part. The I.O. is the slowest. That's just how most things are, really. So um, you actually get back an answer for every single thing in order, which is really nice because now uh, that, that opens you up to be, be able to do some things like um, you want to set x to 1, and then you can, you can even get x. Uh, um, and then when you, when you get this back in your, in your API, and I did this a lot to discuss, because you, anything you can bulk up without needing to know, without needing to get a value, um, you should. So you bulk it up, and then you actually, I would you know, index. I'll get the first thing, because I know, that, I know that, that this thing is important to me, and I know that it's always going to be second, because I get two things. There's no way that it cannot be. This is just. You know, it always returns exactly in the order that you gave it, right? So you can batch up all these things and you can break them out, you know, you could, you could um, assign them different things, store them in different places, but you do one, one back and forth, and that's like just uh, it's transactionless, right? So yeah. if there's a failure on any one yeah. thing, uh, um, you just get back like so, a shorter list. So pipelines by default are <laughs> transactionless. Uh, Redis also has a multi and exec commands. Um, the Python API defaults to those. So pipeline. Um, see, the transaction here is true. So it wraps all these commands. It starts them again. Uh, this is a, um, it's easier to show it here. So uh, new multi, and that starts. It just says, OK. Um, this does not start a trend. Like, this does not block the server or anything. It just says like, okay, um, I'm ready. I'm waiting for your, I'm ready. I'm waiting for your exec command. That's when I'll run the one. 
Um, so you can like set x to one and set x to two and run exec. And it, you, again, it's just like Python, you get back the results of all those. Um, this is not at all like an RDBMS transaction that people are used to, like ACID. Um, you can actually get things <coughs> wrong. You'd say set x to one. Uh, well, no, set x to hello. Anchor x, right? And then set x to two. So I'm, uh, that, that one doesn't matter. I'm setting it to a string. I'm anchoring it. That will definitely fail. I'm setting, I'm setting it to two. Now it's going to complain, but look, x is two. Okay. It is not like something failed, I'm going to stop and roll back. All it means is that I'm getting these things in a bulk. I'm guaranteeing you that I'm going to run them all at the same time without anyone else getting the database lock. So your code has to be correct still, but it gets you the ability to write your own, you know, let's say that Redis didn't implement Inker, you could do it yourself here. By, um, they have a watch command that you, that you run before a multi, this is getting kind of crazy, so, I'm, you know, only a certain amount of people will be interested in this. I can watch X, and then I can do multi, and then I can get, uh, multi, well, how would I do Inker? Hmm. Trying to remember Inker now, but because uh, you can't get in set without using the Python part, you know, like the, the language on the other side. Um, hmm. Maybe Inker is not a good example, but watch. watch yeah, I, I don't have a good one on top of my head. I uh, this is getting pretty like down the rabbit hole. It, it, it's not very common use. Uh, what would happen is. If I started multi, I did whatever I want to do, I run exec, it'll just tell me if between when I started this and I and it received exec, if anything had happened to x, it'll error out. That way I could just try to gain on the loop. That would be how you could implement, I don't know. Uh, there's some way to do exec, and I'm just trying to think, like, I'm actually kind of pumped right now, so. Okay. Uh, so the bold AI yeah, I was going to ask this earlier because you were talking about you know adding to a, a list and treating it like a thing where you could check the link very quickly and then do something about it. but the atomicity being these instructions, you wouldn't be able to uh, check the length and then get, you know, have two different people who are both doing that, checking the length and then deciding, oh, there aren't too many elements so I'm going to add, and they both add. Right. Except, uh, and so without, the, without being able to put conditional code here inside the multi, you wouldn't really be able to do higher order atomic operations like that. Right. Uh, I'm actually, so I've never used multi-exec manually in any sort of use case, so I'm you know, I'm, I'm pretty much stumped here, but there, uh, because I'm, the way I understood it is that uh, you start a multi and you, you know, you set all these things, the exact is where it all runs, so like I said, and like you're saying, well, there's good no way for me to have like, a data structure where, you know, a update of it involves doing these 10 things and then the, if the next guy is going to do simple atomic examination right. of those things, yep. he wants it to be consistent, but um, right. it just doesn't seem to have broader transaction. Right, and then, then on top of the fact that it allows you to have errors, um, also, you have to remember that this is just as durable as everything else. So, you know, you run a transaction in Postgres and you get uh, okay uh, by default configuration. It has sync to disk. It's on platter and magnetic, you know, memory. And uh, this is just like everything else. You get an okay, your transaction worked, but the server could die a second later. Actually, right. check and set's all you need, and you can emulate the rest. What's that? If they had check and set. That's all you would need, then you can emulate. Well, that's what, uh, you can do that with watch, and that's what I'm, I just can't really, I'm not, I can't remember how to connect the dots here, but watch. Oh, I got you, so watch. Watch multi-exec give you compare and swap. Awesome. Yeah, well, I just, yeah, I don't have really good, I, like I said, I just never had you do it, so it's not like fresh in my memory. That's cool. Um, I, uh, that's really the main, that's like the list of main commands. There's PubSub in Redis, people use it for like real-time communications, that's not even a data store thing. It's like this weird bolt-on. You can, um, you can like, well, I'll see. I don't even have a. It's weird because the abstractions are all different. You have to actually, and especially Python, you have to make a class because when you subscribe to something, you kind of need a callback. You need an event that happens when something is sent down that channel. It supports all that. I just, I never use that either, so I don't have a good. Do you, um, you yeah. said real time communications. Do you know anybody who's used something like that in production? Yeah, uh, so, I mean, we actually did discuss. I just, uh, I didn't do that part. So, uh, another thing is Socket.io, I thought that they, Socket.io is in Node. Does anyone use it? They don't use that. They don't use Redis? Okay, so we, would be a good example of something you can do. Yes, uh, Condor uh, had a, I assume their blog's still up though, right? Probably. I hope. The site's dead, man. Yeah. Oh, 
or Redis? Oh wait, no, it was on Eric's thing. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so uh, look for this. Um, they use Redis for it, and we actually have the same thing we discussed. We didn't use Socket.io, which is a real-time thing built in Node. We used Gevent as like a, a real-time web server that would hold connections of Redis up sub. Then like when something would happen on the thread, which is a web page in Discuss, um, it would actually push up to the user and say there's new comments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Is that what's being used over there now for the forum stuff? Discuss? No, it was used for achievements. It was like um, you won something, or you know, because people liked your stuff, you got this thing. But I'm sure they're going to move real time to it, or maybe they have. No, no. Um, so, would you have any qualms about basing uh, your, like your whole comment of you know implementation if you're doing pub sub with your browser? Do you have any any qualms about using Redis for Redis for pub sub? For the whole thing, I mean, for the you still have to store it all somewhere. PubSub doesn't store anything, right? If you're not right. listening, you don't get it. Right. So, well, so comments are, uh, at least the discuss style, are, are long lived. They're not like something, it's not chat room. So, that no, would no, be. Exactly. Okay. So, yeah, so if, if I went to my blog right now, I'll uh, watch out for me, but, um, you know, this is a year old now because I never blog. And so, I, if I reload this, you know, obviously PubSub wouldn't help me here because these need to be stored in a database. Right. No, obviously. Okay. So, what? So I mean, for, for clients that you're, you're more web to you have an Ajax connection, you're listening for, you know, you're Yeah, for, for, for new, for, so like, let's say if you just pull this up on your computer and you right. posted a comment. Right. Yeah, no, totally, and we did. For like, everything. Yeah, okay. yeah, totally. No, it's, it's, uh, it's great because, again, this is a great thing to, uh, pretty easy to shard. There's keys. Mm -hmm. So worst case, you have like four Redis boxes. I mean, again, it's just doing memory operations. It's all I owe. Right. So, I swear, those Redis nodes are just going to be bored out of their mind, even with like 100,000 clients just sitting there waiting. So right. it's, it's all good, for sure. How many subscriptions did you load on a single Redis instance? Um, I think we're only using one, and we had it with like all our logged in users. I don't know, like we had at least like, like 100, well, I don't know, like 100K connections. Um, the other thing is that we had a web server in between. It's like, you know, obviously my browser isn't talking to Redis, right? So there's a embedded web server in between that can actually reuse connections. You know what I mean? One one Redis connection can be subscribed to a hundred thousand things. So that scales. I mean, like pretty infinitely in the sense that like they're all optimized data structures. And, you know, they're not having to like it's not like keys. Just avoid keys. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, that's all really like that's all data structure things. Are there any other questions for Redis in general production? Or you mentioned G events. What is that? Uh, G event is uh, one of the two now popular Python evented uh, network libraries. Okay. So okay. Do, you, do you do Python? A uh, little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's just um, you get to write normal Python. It's a big hack that uses generators to create code routines. Anyways, it's like you can have one process with one thread serving like hundred thousand users because. They're all just taking turns. It's exactly like Redis, actually. It's like this one single thread that's just taking, it's like Node. Very similar. Yes. Same process, somebody's just has that. It's just like Node, but Python. Um, <laughs> a single thread event, basically. It's really awesome. Yeah. Check it out. Um, yeah, any other questions, Redis? Anything else? Like, what does the uh, Python library do when you run into an error like that? Does it raise an exception, or is this one? This one? Yeah. Um, the response error that came up earlier. This, I mean, this one? Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, there was the when you did that when you tried to oh. make her a uh, well no. see, I don't since it's in a since it's in a oh you know it's, it's in a pipeline. Um I mean, that's a, 
Yeah, it's that's pretty pretty shitty. I don't know. That's a, you'd have to you could just literally check that string. I mean, it's, other than that, you're kind of phone. Hope that's nobody's using it. <laughs> I'm going around tonight and I'm making some users. Um, yeah, questions? Yeah, right here. Does Redis have built-in clustering? And if so, how does the client know which node or instance in the cluster has the key store or key parent that you know before? Um, so the Redis version I'm running now is the latest stable. It's 2.4. In 2.6, uh, they're not adding clustering. In 3.0, they're adding clustering. I don't know, maybe in a year. Uh, they have a spec that explains it. It's very kludgy, in my opinion. Um, you to find the uh, key. I think it knows where to, the client has to know. The client has to be smart. Anyways, it, it's it's this like gross abomination of like masters and slaves working together. Um, I'm a Cassandra React Voldemort guy, like true distributed systems. I uh, anything where it's just like yeah we block and copy this thing here and we hope that this thing looks over or here and it just sounds like the guy doesn't really know what he's doing there. Um, I wouldn't recommend it based on it not being out right now. But uh, <laughs> um, so when, when you say you have multiple instances running, right? How are you handling the distribution? That's all in, in the client. In in the client, when I say client, I don't mean the Python. The Python um, uh, API. I mean my code. We had uh, actually. For, so somewhere there's logic saying, you know, if you're looking for this key, go here, and look for this, go there. Right, except it's not, it's not as complex as that sounds. Um, so we wrote this subtraction discussable minus, and um, it had to write us back in, and uh, we would say that it has three hosts, and we would use this partition router, and the partition router literally says, you gave me the X key, I'm going to hash it, and I'm going to modulo it by how many nodes you have, and that's the thing it goes to. Now, that is not smart at all after that. When you add the third node, <coughs> you're effed. Like, there's all the, all the keys are wrong. They go to the wrong place. Like, there's no, like, magic to move things over. That's what the Redis cluster is trying to add. But again, if you, like, read the Dynamo paper, reading things about, like, oh, I'll go over here and magically move things to this node, they just make you shiver. So, um, we just, what, since Redis is basically free, like, a node costs one meg, and single threaded, it's not doing anything periodically um, that's expensive. Uh, just if you decide you want to shard, you need to do it ahead of time. I would put 64 nodes in a box. Like, who cares? 128, doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> and, and then like, when you decide, okay, we're, you know, we, we need to move, you get a second box and you move 64 of them to the other one. <laughs> but again, you have four nodes and you have 32 on each. Like, those things, are, they're all just going to be sitting there idle anyway, right? It just helps you pre-shard, and so you don't have to deal with this nightmare. I would not spend six months of your life to deal with trying to migrate keys personally. Like, <laughs> use React, use Cassandra, use something real for that. <laughs> Thoughts? Any more questions? Other? Yeah. You see, uh, sorry to go back to a question you answered that you were talking about at the beginning, but dealing with caching, you said you were talking about concerns over the client. If you weren't worried about the client, would you have any problem using Redis for caching? That's a, that's a tough one. Uh, I would I would go ahead and say no because for the entire world, including myself, it probably wouldn't matter. Uh -huh. But like memcache still is better if you're Facebook and you're Twitter. Um, it is multi-threaded. It does lock on like individual keys, so you can be like you can just have like people actually get CPU bound on their memcache nodes when they're like at real scale. Uh -huh. So there is this memcache still serves a need, but like yeah, for even discuss, we probably could have been on Redis. Um, I think memcache is better at uh, maybe better at expiring things and evicting things. So, but really for like 99.9% .9 of sites, including the ones I've worked on, it's not a big deal. Okay. But the client is a huge deal, so you can't write that off until you fix it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Any more? All right. Yeah. What was the shell you were using? Um, so I'm on Putty, and then I'm on uh, which part? This one yeah. or this one? <laughs> the uh, the top main part. Uh, this is iPython. Okay. So uh, it's I mean this is Python, and then the really cool stuff is. Yeah, is uh, the stuff like this. And then I think, actually, is that specific to iPython? Or? Yeah. yeah. 